Okay, so this is the next lecture, and uh, we are going to be talking about some protein folding and post translation modifications. So, for proteins, you can have it phosphorylated or methylated or acylated, or you can have a sumo or a ubiquitin. And uh, all these different modifications will allow the protein to bind to other protein, or it can direct the protein to go into different areas of the cell, like the endoplasmic reticulum or some other place. And uh, in simple proteins, um, they you don't need any extra proteins to help it fold. So this protein is growing, and it's just, uh, it's just folding by itself. Uh, and these proteins over mm -hmm. here, this protein over here, is getting help from the HP HSP70 machinery which attach to the hydrophobic parts of the protein. The HSP stands for heat shock protein. Um, the temperature plays a role in folding. So if you increase the temperature in experiments, they found out that uh, the the bacteria increase the number of chaperone proteins so that the proteins could be folded the correct way, which were misfolded due to the increased temperature. And um, more allowed, and then uh, this HSP 70 machinery requires uh, ATP, and HSP have a affinity for the exposed hydrophobic patches of the incomplete folded proteins. And um, these chambers over here, isolation chambers, the HSP60 um, get the incorrectly or incompletely folded proteins placed in here. And these, these sites are hydrophobic protein binding sites, so the proteins are guarded into here because the proteins also don't like water that's around inside the cell, so they, they have affinity to go in here. And they, and they get folded correctly, and this also uses a lot of ATP. And um, some post translational modifications this table is showing. And the formal group on the bacterial amino terminal is, off, is often taken off. And 50% uh, of the eukaryote proteins, the amino group, the N terminal residue is acylated and the carboxy terminal can also be trimmed and modified and uh, we'll skip those slides for now and uh, this is showing different amino acids that are being phosphorylated serine tyrosine furine they're all getting phosphorylated so you add phospho in front of them and then uh, over here we see uh, serine being phosphorylated by the kinase and these phosphorylated by the phosphatase. Um, serine in the milk protein casein is uh, important to be phosphorylated because when it's phosphorylated it can then bind to calcium and then uh, the suckling young has a uh, provision of protein calcium and phosphate in this manner and then Phosphorylation of a protein can either turn it on or the dephosphorylation of a protein can turn it on and vice versa. And uh, you can also have a carboxylated amino acid. You have glutamate here, it's supposed to have one carboxy group. You have two carboxy groups here. And carboxylation is vitamin K dependent. So if you're deficient in vitamin K, carboxylation might not occur. And, um, and carboxylation is important in blood clotting. So if you're deficient in vitamin K, you might not be able to clot blood as good. And also you can give vitamin K antagonists, which would prevent the blood clotting, 
which would be needed for heart patients that have thrombosis, uh, which comes into play in stroke and heart attacks. And um, you have the hydroxylated proline over here, uh, which in conjunction with the glycine, it makes this fibril collagen which is a twisted alpha chain, which is different from a alpha helix because in an alpha helix you can't have proline and glycine and uh, that's what's mainly here. And it's gonna create a long chain like this. And this is an important uh, example in this is an important example in dominant diseases. So, if the amino acids are being, if the proteins are synthesized from both the chromosomes and they're incorporated into one single protein in a chain like this, even if one amino acid is weak, it's gonna mess up the whole protein. So, because the chain is only as strong as its weakest links. And uh, come back to that later.